Welcome to the afternoon session of the second day of Gold Standard University Live. And um, we're lucky to have a, a team up here this time. Um, it's, I call it the uh, Nathan and Braun Show. And uh, I'm sure that, that those of us who've been watching the markets and you see this disappearance of silver, people, you go up in Kitco and nothing's for sale, and then you hear these rumors about Perth Mint, and then you hear these statements, pro and against, that you would, in, maybe in one of your fantasies, you'd like to get one of those guys from the Perth Mint and have them in a room, and get a <laughs> truth serum, and just ask him your list of questions, and at least go home either more disturbed or relieved, or somewhere in between. And then I'm sure that Braun somewhere, maybe when he reads all this stuff, and he sees these people going left and right and swinging these crazy theories, wish that he had the opportunity to either calm these people down, <laughs> either tell them the truth, or continue the lie. <laughs> I'm just neutral. <laughs> and I think we're, get, we're both getting our chances. And we're really fortunate to have Braun here from Perth Mint to tell us really the insight, what's going on. I mean, I talked to Braun yesterday and it really set me at ease. It really did. The questions, I, I asked him a few questions. He was right on it. He knew it from the inside and I, I just felt so much better about it. Though I do have to make some phone calls when we get home about allocating our, our accounts, all right? And, and it was because of that phone call. And I, and I really felt good about it. And uh, Nathan is, um, he's going to act as our uh, surrogate uh, questioner, all right? Our uh, grand inquisitor. And find out the truth about um, shortages and uh, lag times and um, all those other things that you wanted to know and were too afraid to ask. So here we are, the, the Nathan and Braun Show. Thank you, Bill. I'll, uh, I'll say a few brief words about myself and my background uh, before I get into uh, questioning Braun uh, and also a few brief comments on what was discussed this morning in these sessions that I think are, uh, that I think are relevant. Uh, I have a background of, I would say, at least 15 to 20 years of studying gold. I've been in the financial services industry for about 12 years now. Uh, only uh, 18 months of that actually selling gold, which is what I do now. I work for Bullion Management Group, a Canadian company, uh, and uh, we have uh, a couple of main products. The uh, mutual fund, or I think down here in Australia, would be a unit trust, uh, which is made up simply of gold, silver, and platinum bars in roughly equal proportions available globally, uh, but uh, the other product that we have that is just being launched, also available globally, is the Bullion Bars program, as we call it, where you can uh, custom make your own blend of metals, and they're held uh, for you in Canada, or shipped to you if you like, uh, and uh, it's entirely allocated. You will get what it will be called a Bullion Deed with the uh, uh, name of the, uh, uh, the refiner, the uh, serial number, the weight, purity, uh, and we will hold it for you or it can be delivered to you. I'm sure my boss would also want me to mention the third product that we have, not necessarily a, a product in the sense of a financial and, uh, 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 direct, and direct investment in gold, but we are a private company, but we are also raising money for our big marketing push uh, soon to come. And there is private stock available in the company as well, which I think is a, a, a sort of a built-in leverage for those people that are tired of mining stocks not working or fear to, uh, fear to step into the options or futures market for fear of getting the timing wrong. Uh, there is a leverage way to play the success of our company as people, as the world wakes up to the fact that they need to allocate to gold. Now that's all I'll say by way of a, a sales pitch. Uh, a couple of comments I wanted to make about the, uh, uh, what was discussed this morning. When the professor uh, mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, a bit of an intuition for him that silver is the canary in the coal mine and would go into backwardation first, I thought of two, uh, not exactly scientific comments, but uh, two other reasons why I think that's true. Uh, I, you know, you can debate where a proper gold-silver ratio lies, but I think probably everybody in the room, or the majority of the people in the room, would agree that silver is undervalued relative to gold right now. That would cause the stocks of silver to run out faster than gold, other things being equal. And even if you didn't believe that, uh, I think the other reason is the old saying that uh, silver is the poor man's gold. Uh, you know, to use an analogy, it's a little worn out. Uh, in, on the Titanic, it was the third-class passengers that uh, noticed the water in the hallway first. Uh, ultimately affected the entire ship, but uh, I think that as the crisis gets worse, the poor will feel it first, uh, and uh, they are only able to afford silver, uh, and that's, I think, what we're already seeing in Mexico, maybe a little bit, uh, and other places around the world. The only other point I wanted to make before I uh, question Braun is, uh, 
the uh, comment that Daryl was saying, I'm, I'm, you know, Daryl, uh, it was very, very useful the way he pulled us back into the big picture, I think, and said, this is all an exercise in the governments of the world throughout history trying to take away the gold and silver option from people for saving and various people or um, uh, entities trying to bring it back. Now, uh, it's a little gloomy uh, to talk about JFK being assassinated potentially because of his attempt to bring back a silver certificate and all the rest. Uh, but I would say, uh, you know, it is reality that we're in a war, uh, and it's a war for our own freedom, ultimately. Uh, every person in this room, you strike a mighty blow every time you buy a gold coin, uh, because it simply moves that much more gold into private hands. Uh, but I guess what I wanted to say is it's not necessarily a gloomy struggle towards a bleak future where our standard of living falls. I think that, uh, you know, whatever the chance of a breakdown of civilization, I think it's relatively small, and I think we will come through this for the simple reason that uh, there are enough people in the world that still believe in the American dream. It's really a global dream now, the idea that if you work hard, you will be rewarded, you will get ahead. Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of those people who were not uh, prepared and did not study gold and its role in history uh, will pay the ultimate price. You know, a simple example, I had a wonderful baker that I used to buy my bread from regularly in Vancouver, and he eventually worked himself to death. He died of a heart attack because, as the professor has pointed out, it's a bad time to be a small business owner. Uh, the odds are stacked against you. The banks uh, run, uh, run the show. Anyhow, that's all my monologue. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's good times ahead. I think we're in, uh, we're in very good times, if anybody had any doubt, uh, and we'll soon be rewarded for our patience. Now, my first question for... Uh, Could I do a little intro of myself? Oh, and sure, yeah. Just, yeah, because I had some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, right ahead. <laughs> yeah, attack me later. Um, uh, I, I started working with Perth Mint in 1994 in Sydney, um, and uh, I've done a lot of things in the Mint over that time. I started by selling physical bullion over the counter, real bars to people coming in with cash and wanting to hand it over for some physical, so that's my starting point. But I just want to probably mention that I am here in a private capacity. I'm not here in an official capacity. Um, but, you know, Tom sort of saw my blog, which I just got up here and, and thought I might be interested in it. And uh, I had seen the professor's stuff many years ago on the internet, but never got around to getting into it fully. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's why I'm here for that. So I just want to make that sort of clear. And, and on that basis, probably a lot of the stuff, I'm, I'm happy to answer specific questions, but I don't really sort of want to do a big sell job on the Perth Mint. What's and, that uh, uh, Well, you can get it down, goldchat.blogspot. Yeah, blogspot, just the um, Google blogspot. Uh, a lot of the statements I'll make probably more general statements. I don't want to get specific about, you know, uh, because Perth Mint does things, but other manufacturers and producers of products operate a different way. And so we're not talking about some of the things in the industry. I might well probably be more talking in general terms, happy to answer specifics, but I'll also just be talking in general some of the commercial factors in play at this end of the business that I deal in. Um, and also, which some people don't sort of get is, just because I'm explaining is not necessarily does not equal an excuse. I'm not trying to make excuses for what happens. Um, you know, it's just an explanation. These are some of the factors that I've written on my blog about why we have production shortages. They're not meant to be excuses, they're just an explanation of some of the things that go on in the thinking, and I'm just hoping to provide that sort of information. And just one thing to close, because I was talking um, near the bar, and I was telling the story about um, the street that I used to live in, and it seemed to be of amusement to a few people, so I thought I'd just recount it, because I went home and, uh, into the apartment, sorry, and just had a bit more think about what happened. Um, when I was about eight, um, I used to live in a cul-de-sac. And it was actually, not a cul-de-sac, it was actually a dead end. And because what happened is when they subdivided this block of land, they built this road through, and these are houses, put all these houses, but this was one lady, an old lady, who owned this huge block at the end, and she didn't want to sell. And it doesn't matter how much money they offered her, so they just built the road, ended it, and then at the end of our street, we therefore had this lovely bush, open bit of land that sat there for probably 20 years um, until she finally died and her family sold it off. But that was great for us as kids because this has a little play area for us. It was bush, the trees in it, and it had little cubby holes and houses that we built or whatever. Um, and as your kids, you sort of start exploring. It was reasonably large, and up here in the corner, 
we found one day um, a, a bit of probably gyp rock or drywall for the Americans. It was in the shape of a, an arch. I think it must have been you know, some sort of arch over a doorway. And on it were a whole lot of tiles. And around it, lying around, were these sort of more rectangular blue sort of tiles. And um, kids being kids, and I don't know whether I started this game or it was someone else's suggestion, but we said, well, let's, we chipped all these tiles off and we said, let's make this money for these credits. So we set up a system, we said, okay, the little square ones will make equal one credit, and there were these sort of more oblong ones which are about twice the size, so we'll make them equal to 10, 10 credits. So we created this, and of course what we decided then is that we'd all found this, so we would split this great stash up evenly, which is the fair thing to do. It was a communal asset that we had found. Uh, so we split up this asset, and everyone got a direct proportion, you know, probably maybe 10 of the little ones, and I think maybe two of these more larger ones. So we each had uh, 10, 20, 30 credits of money. And, uh, and I can tell you, uh, I used to live here, so me and my sister, it was two of us, we got um, two stashes. There was a poor guy here, he was an only child, he just got one stash. He sort of felt a bit unfair that <laughs> our family <laughs> controlled a bit more of the money, but you know, it had to be, we, we argued that it had to be divided by each of the persons equally, not by family. He argued for, a, you know, that it should go family. <laughs> and there were four kids in that <laughs> house, so they got probably the majority of it. And I can tell you, we felt quite wealthy. We had these little bags of these jingly ceramic things, and we had money. And I, I can't remember specifically whether... I'm pretty sure that there actually were some deals that were done. You know, give me your football and I'll give you ten of my green tiles or credits. So I think there were a few transactions that, that took place, similar to what the professor was saying, handing over real goods for fiat. <laughs> these credits that we all agreed were worth something. Um, what happened is interesting because the, one of the kids that lived in this house went out to, I think he was looking at his backyard and his dad had been renovating the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and he found some much larger purple <laughs> so he came to us and he said, well, you know, if I've got a more square one, which is about four times the size, these things, because it's interesting, you know, just as kids, we had this intrinsic understanding that if there were many of these and less of these, these were worth more. I just find that interesting observation. This is eight-year-old children, okay? Anyway, he came and said, well, because this is four times the size of that, you know, this should be worth 20 credits. Um, and he said, there aren't that many of them, you know, I don't have that much. And um, I can't remember whether he told us that he only had five of these, but there were really, you know, 50 in the backyard or whatever. I'm not sure exactly how that played out. But then, of course, what I did was I went around and buried and had a look in my um, backyard under the house sort of was a, on um, poles and found um, these more sort of white, sort of funny sort of shaped tiles. And before too long, of course, we know what happened. The whole system broke down. <laughs> now, you may find it, um, yeah, interesting. I mean, this is a fair currency story. What I hadn't reflected on until I just I was talking and had, had a thought of this last um, yesterday and then thought about it last night, is that maybe this is a Freud, some sort of Freudian subconscious explanation of how I've ended up at a mint, <laughs> and indeed how I've ended up here, and why I, maybe I learnt a lesson subconsciously here about fiat, and <laughs> I'll leave it <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, with that, uh, my first uh, general question is, uh, would you say that, um, let's say five years ago, uh, what, how often when somebody bought a Perth Mint certificate, actually, I should back up even before that, mm -hmm. uh, maybe tell us a little bit about how the, uh, the program, uh, just a simple short explanation for people that aren't maybe familiar with it. Yeah. How does the actual program work? If I come to you and say, I'd like to buy a Perth Mint certificate of 1,000 ounces of silver, 
uh, here's the money, what, what do I get and what are the promises you make? Um, yeah, the Perth Mint uh, uh, has always been in the business of selling physical um, and relatively recently because we've been doing this for 100 plus years of, of making physical gold coins. Um, it came up with this concept of maybe getting a bit more into the storage side of things. Um, and we had done that in a small way up until probably the mid-90s when um, Asset Strategies International, which is a, a, a sort of a dealer of the certificate, who also sold the Makata delivery orders. Um, and came to us and said, can you do something similar to a Makata delivery order, but with a few more bells and whistles? So in a, in a lot of sense, the certificate program is, is a copy of a Makata delivery order. Um, uh, and there's two options really when you come to buy. It, it is a classic allocated. Do you want to have bars made up, pay for that to be made up, put aside in the vault, you know, in the corner and set aside? Um, but what we also then um, offered was an unallocated option. And in retrospect, when we put this together, I probably should have done a bit more research on what the word unallocated meant, because I only sort of subsequently realised that that word has negative connotations in the US market. Um, uh, and we probably should have called it unsegregated physical or something, something like that, or made up some new terminology. But in essence, what it is is you are buying part of the work in progress metal that sits in the mint, because the mint needs a ongoing amount of metal in process at all times to be able to make coins and bars and indeed to do refine, refining out at the refinery. Um, so the investors in a short, to, in a sh short answer are actually buying part of that um, work, in, work progress. in progress inventory. Um, and maybe if we've got time I can go and explain how that works, probably mechanics of that in a little bit more detail. But then we get into London metal accounts and swaps and all sorts of other sort of more technical stuff which you know maybe we can do as a separate thing for those that are interested. Okay well then my next question is five years ago uh, 2003 mm. uh, could you give a rough estimate of for the new money coming in uh, in a typical year how what percent of that uh, of those investors would ask for physical delivery or to have it uh, allocated? Uh, well category? the people that were buying in um, to be honest I don't I think there's been a slight increase in the proportion that would be going allocated as opposed to unallocated, but nothing, nothing really significant. Um, and to put an approximate figure on, we probably hold about 10% of allocated and 90% is unallocated. Um, and, and notwithstanding all the recent um, Jason Hommel stuff, um, and you know, we did see a reaction to that. We had a lot of people ringing up saying, I'm not comfortable with that, I want to convert. Um, but nothing significant. And indeed, the new inflows are still sort of a 10%, 90% ratio to unallocated. But there has been a, um, a, an increase towards taking physical delivery, um, no doubt. Um, and, you know, five years ago, it would be very rare you might get a client once every couple of months someone would ring up and say I want to take a bit of physical. Um, now, now that's a bit more frequent but nothing that's probably you know, excessive at least within the depository side of the business. Okay, because that the line of questioning I was going to pursue there was uh, it really all depends on what is actually in the contract that these people sign mm. if they were told that it would take X number of days you know you would have delivery or you would be able to shift from unallocated to allocated mm. within a certain number of days yep. uh, and as long as the mint is still within that mm. then there's no issue but on the other hand if you said well yes you know you can shift and it shall be within 14 days mm. you shall be you know able to shift categories and if the mint is now breaching that then that's I think a legitimate cause for people mm -hmm. on the internet to complain even if they aren't maybe pointing out that so what yeah. is the actual how the, the, the legal, the, yeah, the contracts read that allocated is available um, for collection within two days, and within we only put days. we only put two days on it because, um, you know, and to be clear, the Perth Mint is not, um, whilst the business is marketed as a depository, the Perth Mint is not actually, a, you know, its business is not depository, i.e., warehousing. Its business is making, you know, coins. So we have vaults, but those vaults are usually full of <laughs> operational metal, and the guys are you know, taking, booking metal in and out to the various departments as we manufacture it. 
So we only put a two day window on because we needed to coordinate with the production guys to make sure that you know we can come in and take the bars out because effectively you've got sort of operational metal in one bolt and another bolt's got a bit of stuff and the rest of it's all the allocated sitting in on, this, on the other side, locked up, um, sort of segregated in that way. Um, so we put a two day thing just to give us an operational time to get it. In practice, you know, in normal situations, it's, you know, some clients have turned up that day and we're like, okay, we'll wait and we'll ring the bolt guy and you know, you can have it now. So, um, and on unallocated, the, the contract is 10 days, 10 business days. Okay. Um, well, those sound very reasonable, but uh, what I've been reading on the internet is that there have been much longer delays when people wanted to convert from uh, unallocated to allocated or to come and get their actual metal. Mm. Is that correct? And if so, how long have those delays been? Uh, I'm not, yeah, I, I, I don't know of any specific cases myself. Um, I, I can't, I mean, I'm not going to say that we haven't stuffed up, to be honest, and I think you need to probably consider that the Treasury Department that runs that business has really got two bullion dealers and a couple of support admin people. Um, so I think a lot of the problems that happened when, um, and really this is all instigated from Jason Hommel sort of stuff that he wrote, um, when you get a flood of people coming in saying want to convert and take delivery and collect and all of that, limited staff, the inboxes are piling up, and in some sense I suppose we didn't respond adequately in terms of staffing that up to be able to meet that demand. Um, and you know, to be honest, it's just plain staff stuff ups as well. I mean, so I think those are a lot of the reasons behind it. Uh, what what is interesting though is that, um, and this is why I'm, you know I'm not that close to the detail, but we never actually had a client write and put a formal complaint in that their contract terms hadn't been met, which is what I would have expected. Um, that, you know, if we had a 10 day commitment and you didn't get it within 10 days, then, you know, you should complain and say, I want restitution or some sort of compensation or what are you going to do about it? You know, and we didn't, we never had that. And um, to be honest, I wish people would write into the CEO and say, I wasn't happy. Because it's only if the CEO gets a letter that he's going to go and kick someone's ass and something's going to happen, you know, in a way. Um, so, because that's never happened, I, I know they did stuff up a few things, but I, I'm not sure that it's maybe as bad as it's being pointed out. Um, yeah. Now, the other thing that I've, again, read online, I don't recall the source, but the, uh, the commentator was saying that what is in fact happening is that because you're serving industrial customers as well as retail, mm. that you've simply decided to favour, there was a decision made at the top of the Mint to, to favour the industrial customers over the retail, simply because the retail, as you pointed out, many of them maybe you know, either didn't have the resources to, to launch. I mean, they, they certainly could have written a formal complaint, mm. but they might have looked at it and said, well, I can't afford to sue. I'm a small investor. Mm. What's the point of even going any further? I'll just have to wait and see what happens. Mm. Uh, it, can you comment on that, or do you think that's libelous? Or uh... Uh, Look, yeah, the Mint, the Mint deals in a wide range of products and a wide range of people. So, and, you know, I mean, 80 plus percent of what we produce is exported. You know, the Australian domestic demand for retail precious metal, even jewellery demand, is very small. Uh, so, you know, the and and I'd probably maybe explain this by you know you, the mint is set up in profit centres, and uh, so you have a manufacturing department, you have a depository, you have a the retail outlet that you buy physical from. Uh, and maybe the com lines of communication between those aren't that great. But what has happened, say, with this recent thing where the Mint stops taking orders, which I suppose the professor and, and gets misinterpreted as doesn't have anything, um, is uh, a case of the, the order takers in the wholesale department, you know, getting phone calls from large bullion um, trading houses saying I want to buy a ton of one ounce coins or whatever and they're going yeah yeah fine and they're just placing their order and the next guy's doing his order and before we knew it two months three months worth of production had been committed um, you know so there is that chance that there's not really that sort of great sort of overview where and given the market's moving so quickly it, it happens so quickly that say like production gets locked out and the mint had to say it was only after the fact that the senior management said wait a minute why have we locked three months, we've got to stop taking orders until we can get on top of it. Because we can't really start going out, committing further and further delivery lead times on stuff, primarily to wholesalers. 
um, you know, we need to take stock and work out where we are and how we will manage this going forward. But it, so in that sense, there's no explicit, um, you know, management decision to favour wholesaling versus retailing at all. It's a case of the market moving so quickly that, you know, what is it being taken without necessarily realising what that's doing to the production side. Mm. But um, I do think that... Um, we need to make a commitment more to the retail side and specifically on the domestic demand. Um, and I've made that point internally and I think that's been taken on board. Um, we've just got to make sure that departments are talking to each other and prioritising the orders for the retail domestic market. Whether that re domestic market is wholesale to coin distributors in Australia, um, but I certainly think the retail, the Australian demand should take priority um, over international. Um, which won't be any good to the US because there will be less coins going into their market, but um, that's how it should operate. Well, that's, that's actually a more disturbing answer than the one I thought you were going to give me. <laughs> if, I can, if I can summarize what you've told me so far, what you've said is, yes, you know, we are in breach of our contracts, but nobody has complained about it yet. Uh, management did not see... Now, is it a government-owned... Uh, Government yeah, it's West entity? Australian, West Australian government. Owned. Okay, yeah, well, that's, yeah. you know, that may have, that may explain part of it. My next question is going to be, how could the the people running, you know, at the very top, not have been exposed to at least one or two gold bugs over the years who said you'd better make sure that this is, uh, you know, because there's a crisis coming and that's why we uh, need this kind of thing. It, it amazes me that the the mint could be caught flat-footed like this. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, the uh, the next question I have for you is the terms. There was a well, just to address that, I mean, oh, I'm, sure. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're in breach of all obligations. I act, I'm not sure that there's that many breaches of those delivery obligations for the depository customers. Oh, yes, that's right. There is no... That's, you, yeah, I, yeah. I apologize, you did point I, I, that and out. And, I, and no, I think, uh, actually, a lot of the stuff as well is, um, uh, you know, at, at, we do... There is, in a sense, an obligation, but it's not a contractual obligation to supply metal to the local market. But I think what happens is that and a lot of the stuff that I have seen is that someone rings up our retail outlet and says, I want to buy a two and a half ounce gold bar, and we say, well, we've run out, you know, made a pile of them, they've been sold out, and then they go on into and say, they've got no gold, when what we haven't got is the specific size that they want. You know, and there might have been a five ounce bar or a ten ounce bar, you know, available. So a lot of it gets blown out of proportion. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, at one stage, yep, the, the shop had sold all of its production at one stage, all of its orders that it had on the floor, and had to go to the back to say, I need some more, to get some more in. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would draw that comment, because that's right. We didn't establish that there were actually people lined up complaining that they hadn't gotten their medal. Mm. So I guess the next avenue of questioning I'll pursue is the uh, the actual, is is there a storage fee associated with the ownership of a Perth Mint certificate, unallocated or allocated? Allocated, yes. Unallocated, no. Okay, and of course, once it is allocated, then there is a, no, there, is a uh, there is an actual uh, bar uh, serial up. number, yep. uh, uh, everything recorded. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because I was going to ask you, uh, this is not directly related to the Perth Mint, but I think it was either Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley. Someone had bought mm. certificates. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy uh, uh, eight years ago, or whatever, he'd been he'd been uh, holding them for four years. He'd been getting charged storage, and then when he went to claim them, Merrill Lynch said, "Well, we don't actually have them." And he said, "Well, how in the world can you <laughs> charge me with storage?" At which point, when he sued uh, Merrill Lynch, they backed down and said, "Okay, here's the money back." Mm -hmm. But part of their defense was, "Well, everybody does this with uh, metal certificates. We charge storage, uh, charge uh, charge storage, but we don't have the actual metal." No. <laughs> but that's not an issue. It sounds like you're saying it's not an issue with the person. Yeah, and that's why I said when when we first put this together, that choice of unallocated, it, retrospectively, is a bad word, and we haven't probably distinguished enough about um, what the business model is of of it. And it's a unique business model um, because I suppose uh, you know Kitco's unallocated is the same thing. It's funding his work in progress, his operational metal as well. Um, but there aren't really a lot of entities that can do that because there aren't really a lot of entities that people will trust to do it. Jewelers could do it. I mean, a large manufacturing jeweler could come and say, buy my inventory, and you know, because I've always got X amount of gold going in process. But you need credibility to be able to do that. And to be honest, the only reason why we do it and why it's been successful is because we are West Australian government owned and we have a very explicit government guarantee, you know, standing behind the, the Mint's operations, um, I don't think it would probably 
if it was a standalone private mint that it would probably work. Um, it's that explicit government guarantee that um, I suppose makes people comfortable. Okay, and uh, I didn't ask this question specifically, but since we're, we're more concerned just at the moment with silver, have you noticed, uh, are the whatever problems or rumors of problems that there might have been of, of customers being unhappy, have you gotten a sense that it is more with silver rather than gold? Is that a correct assumption? Uh, well, what I, what I would say is that my feeling is that the silver market is tighter than the gold market. Um, we don't have any problem getting hold of bulk metal. I mean, gold, to explain the dynamics in Australia, um, you know, AJR Matthews, really the refiner, does about 98% of Australia's gold production. You know, is between 200 to 300 tonnes a year. And the domestic demand, our, our requirements plus jewellery requirements are nowhere near that, and all that goes exported. Um, so we can source our metal locally. Um, silver's a bit different because silver... Um, is not the refinery is really a gold refinery that produces silver as a byproduct um, of that gold refining. It's not purely a dedicated sort of silver refinery. We'd rather put its capacity to gold refining. So I think a lot of the silver normally that's enough to meet our demand um, that we need. But you know this recent increase in retail interest has required us to go into the London market to ship 20 tonnes of silver in, you know, at a time to give us the raw material to be able to make the coins. Um, so it is unprecedented um, in that sense. And probably just to um, give you a feel for that, um, if I just draw a graph of, because I was just curious of this, and so if we go on time um, and say ounces, and there's very approximate, but I just went into our retail computer system and just dumped out data to see what was going on. And uh, it, it sort of fluctuates like this, and then I think 0405 when it went up to 700 or broke through, what I can't remember when that was, we had a spike. And then what we've seen now is this. So this recent last few months is unprecedented in the amount of the demand that has come. Probably, you know, maybe this is not the exact scale, this is probably higher, and I, I would say that, you know, this is just our experience, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is um, replicated with other coin dealers in Australia, if not internationally, probably more so. Um, I suppose the point of this shows that we have seen large demand, um, but this is unprecedented. And what is also interesting about this is that within that um, selling volume, uh, you know, this would be what we sell and this is what we would buy back. There's always some two-way business. Um, and this would be maybe, um, you know, this is probably not accurate, might be 20 to 30 percent we buy back in a ratio of what we sell. Um, it's so low because I think that what happens in Australian market is that people sell back to other coin dealers locally, not so much to us. And that's also because our prices are, I suppose what you'd say, recommended retail prices. We don't try and price compete against our distributors in Australia. Um, and being a sort of, I suppose, a government bureaucracy in a way, although we are a commercial entity, the buyback prices are sort of set and are fixed. If you look at the Perth Mint spread, you'll always see that it's somewhat stable, whereas a, a on-the-ground local coin dealer is more able to push that price up to suck some metal in to be able to resell and, and make some money. But what we're seeing now is this down to here. It's bugger all. No one is selling back. And then this goes up even more. So it's not just a case of, um, you know, this say, say this is a 100 and we are buying back 300, so the net net physical that we're having to produce is 70 ounces. What's happening is this 30 is now going down to 10, so the 70 becomes 90, and then this is going up to 200. So it's a really an increase from 70 to 190. And I think that that, which is what we're seeing, and I think that is what's happening um, all over the world at the retail level. It's not just an increase in demand, it's a dropping back of the buyback, the, the metal that would normally be resold in. And just to, probably as a, an aside, 
uh, and what I have noticed, and I don't know if this is um, counterintuitive, and maybe this just reflects the depository clients that deal with, I don't know, but in some sense it is a retail thing, is that the, if you've got a price that's doing this, that what I have found is that demand matches that. So when we look at how many ounces or accounts are being opened, it's very highly correlated. Now that may not make much sense to you because most people would think, well, if the price is high, it should actually be a, not new buying, people should be selling back, but that's not what happens. New highs in the gold price shift more people into thinking, I want to buy gold, and they are buying in. When it drops, and stabilises and bounces around, it flattens out, people get bored. So in some sense it's a combination of these new high prices and volatility that drives investment demand in. Um, and, and I suppose maybe it's reflecting the fact that as the gold price breaks a new high, you know, as journalists write some article saying gold has now broken $700. And then that trick tips someone who was on the edge of thinking I might buy gold to then saying I'd better buy some gold. And these, so these increases and spikes that we've seen in the gold price have sucked and tipped more people over to making that decision to buy gold. And I think we're now at the end where this recent one, all these people that came through are now also adding to their holding, plus there are new people coming in, which is why I think it's driving this demand retail at, even to more higher levels. Um, yeah, so. Okay, well I guess maybe one final question to tie it together and before we throw it open to questions from the floor. Uh, is it a true statement to say that if the music stopped this afternoon and you looked at the total extent of the unallocated uh, silver certificates at the Perth Mint and you looked at the total work in progress, subtracted any absolute contractual claims that larger commercial entities might have against that work in progress, mm. is it absolutely true that every unallocated silver holder does have an ounce of silver somewhere in there yes. to there. So yes. it is 100% backed yeah. according to that um, definition. Yes, okay. and um, I suppose uh, let me say that something that, and I can go and explain why, but the Perth Mint different, um, which is something new to me coming in and I studied accounting as part of my degree, is that the Perth Mint actually runs a metals balance sheet actually runs four balance sheets, um, one for gold, silver, platinum, palladium, in addition to its normal AUD currency account. And we actually have a guy whose title is metal accountant. They're the financial accountants, um, and their job is to do the profit and loss statement and all of that, but we have one guy whose job is to do metal accounting, and you might say, and, and when we went out to look spec computer systems and find out how um, looking for a new ERP system, no vendor has, has, has got that specification. No one, and they didn't know, what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. And I'll, I can explain later, because it's more technical, and why and how that does, and it's related to leasing and how we hedge or how we don't wish to be exposed to the gold price. Because what we do is we say, and the job of this accountant every quarter at the stock tape is to add up it goes through and adds up all those ounce denominated liabilities because they're not they're contractual obligations in ounces, they're not contractual obligations in money. Um, and indeed, to, to just to diverge slightly, I mean, when we in the leasing market we say lease gold, I mean, the contract that you get when you do a borrow gold from a bullion bank says, you know, I have borrowed 1,000 ounces of gold at 1%, you know, for six months. And for an accountant, they can't account for that because there is no dollars on that contract. Because an accountant says, I have a, a piece of paper and my job as an accountant is to work out the value and do a debit and a credit. But when you get a lease contract, it's totally denominated in ounces. There is no price put onto it. It says, you must give me the thousand ounces back at the end of the six months. I don't want money, I want ounces. Um, and actually, another diversion, it's interesting that it's called a lease. It's not called a loan. And I find that quite interesting. It's the lease rate, not the interest rate for gold. And when I came into the industry, I said, I thought about that. No, I said, why is it a lease rate? And my reason for that is, is that um, the word lease um, implies ownership. 
you lease a car or you rent a house, you pay a rental fee or a lease fee for the car. But who owns the car and the house? Not you. When that rental period's over, you leave the house, the owner of the house still owns it. And I don't think it's coincidental that the gold industry therefore called gold loans leases. Because what they're saying subtly is, that's my gold, I own it, even though probably legally the title has passed and so forth, you know, they've got the physical gold and you have an obligation to repay it. But there's this subtlety where that's my gold, it's a lease, I own it, I'm just renting it to you and I want that gold back. And because of that, the Perth Mint operates on a basis of saying, I've got all these ounce denominated liabilities to clients, unallocated clients, as well as probably a few leases in that we need to do that we on lease the refinery, I'm diverging. And then that metals account at the end of the quarter goes and looks at all the physical stock take and all the other balances that we hold out in the refinery and so forth and adds that up and says, do I have a balance? Do I have a balancing balance sheet? Debits and credits must add, assets and liabilities must match. And we want them to match because if they don't match, we are exposed to the price exposure. As long as we've got 100 ounces owed to people and we've got 100 ounces of physical assets, it doesn't matter if the gold price goes up, the gold price goes down. Because the liability values went up, the assets went up, or the liability value goes down, the asset goes down. We are totally hedged in a way. Yeah, and I guess I, guess I should have added, no, no one else has any claim. I mentioned industrial, but there's no other claims from any other uh, activities that you've done, no other encumbering of that work in progress. That's right. It, it, well, it in some sense, okay. it, yeah, as I said, there's... There, he adds those assets as explicitly separate and look at, we're not saying any particular pile is owned. We just go, that was the physical stock take. They went around, they counted all the stock, added it all up, multiplied by how many finances of gold is in each of these things that are lying around and then just add those liabilities as separate. And that's his job is every day, every quarter to reconcile the movements and to reconcile those balances to make sure they add up. Okay. Um, yeah, so it, it, we're quite particular about that. Um, because we don't want to have an imbalance. It's, there's two reasons. We don't want to have an imbalance of assets and liabilities. This does mean that we have a price exposure. You know, if we've got too much assets to the liabilities, we're long gold. If we've got too many liabilities and not enough assets, we're short gold. Either way, we don't want to be short or long. The Perth Mint, in some sense, is agnostic on where the price is going. It's like the warehouser for grain. He doesn't really want to know about where the grain price is. His job is just to store it. And we are the way, our job is just to fabricate it and make some money on the premium of the product. We don't want to take a price exposure. Um, so, yeah, it, that's part of the reason we're so particular about it. And we do that balance sheet down to a thousandth of an ounce. The other reason we're so particular about it is because we also want to know whether anyone's stealing the gold out in the factory. <laughs> <laughs> and whilst we have, you know, um, security checks and, and they go through x-rays or whatever as they go out, it's also a second control on top of also the physical controls within the Mint um, to make sure that we are not, there's no, some guy within the Mint has not found some way to secrete gold out of the system. Um, and we've got many other controls on top internally. I mean, it, you could imagine that Mint is a physically locked down building and there's only one entry and exit point for the staff and they all get screened. So the, the whole asset and liability balancing is also a internal control mechanism. Okay. All right. Well, with that, uh, yes. Uh, go ahead, Lawrence. I just add one little point. Please, that, please stand uh, and. Uh, <coughs> as a relatively satisfied Perthmint customer, I'd only add one thing that didn't get much mention, and that is when you do acquire allocated gold, either by trading your unallocated gold or just calling up the phone and saying I want to buy some, there are fabrication charges. Mm. And the smaller the unit of gold, the higher they are. In a per ounce basis. Per yeah. ounce basis, yes. So I think I was paying $74 an ounce. No. Well, anyway, to get 100 ounce bars, I was paying a considerable premium. Mm. But it was worth it to have the small sizes. Yes, yes. And, I mean, that reflects, you know, in to, to get the economics of the production process, the relative cost of stamping a one ounce coin is somewhat similar to stamping a 10 ounce coin. You know, it's the same, same press, same time to punch it. Um, there's obviously a bit more involved in the, the pre-stage. Um, so yeah, the, there's somewhat similar cost to doing that. So the more metal we have within the one blob, the lower the per ounce price is going to be. 
Um, I might just diverge onto the US Mint as well, just to explain the problem I mentioned to a few people about why their particular problem, um, which I think is worth sort of pointing out, because I think to some extent it may have been a bit unfairly um, attacked. And whilst I, you know, can't sort of rule out conspiracy that, you know, they've been directed not to make um, coins, uh, it, it's probably worth to note that the production process for a coin is, a, is effectively a two-stage process. It's a process of making the blank, and that process is a what you would probably call very much a process manufacturing, I like chemicals. And then after it's a blank, it's more like unit manufacturing. And what do I mean by that? To make a blank, you have to get a blob of gold, put it into an extrude and melt it. It gets extrudes out to a strip. You've got to roll that strip to make sure you're going to get to the exact thickness that you need. Um, it's got to be exact. The diameter and thickness will determine the weight. So you've got to roll it to an exact thickness. You know, if it rolls wobbly, throw it back in, melt it down. You then punch your little circular holes out of this strip. You've got to throw the rest of that strip back in, melt it down, use it again. You then get those blanks. Hopefully, if you get it right, they're reasonably accurate, but they're not always accurate. Um, and mints being mints, don't want to give away any free extra. So we, our job is to try and get this coin down to one ounce, but not below it. And so what does this mean? It means that we're very, very particular about weight control. And what they will do is get a pile of these things, weigh them in batch, and say, overall, on average, these things are 1.001 ounces, or 1.1 ounces for each blank. That's too much. The chemist will do a calculation. They'll stick it into a vat of acid um, and pickle it, which will slice it. You'll go, OK, given that it's got this much excess silver on it and this chemical will react this long, it stays in here for 10 seconds, pulls it out. Hopefully, all these blanks have been reduced from 1.1 down to 1.001. And then you go and check those blanks, so they weigh them all. And we've got a little automatic sort of machine that sticks them on a scale and throws out the rejects and all of this stuff goes in. It's a messy process. You've got chemicals, you've got solutions, you've got to throw stuff in, remelt it and do it. When you're finished with that process, you're then stuck with these hopefully weight, very tightly toleranced weight blanks, which you can then just shove into the machine. They get stamped and packaged up and sent out. And that part of the process is somewhat easy. And what happened, um, or what the US Mint has done, and I'm not sure when they did this, is they outsourced that blank process. Um, the Perth Mint does both, and we keep it in-house because we want to control the entire production process. Partly a quality issue, it's also a control over our production. And I don't know why the US Mint decided to outsource, maybe they had some con smart consultant come in and tell them, look, you know, this is non-core business and it's messy and it's chemicals and, you know, um, outsource it. And you should just have minting machines and get these blanks from the people, blah, blah, blah. You can sack all these workers and, you know, and I don't know, that's most my most likely explanation. And they just said, yeah, yeah, that sounds very great and efficient. And interestingly, and it's public knowledge, because you go to the Sunshine Mints website in the US and they say they're a major supplier, the major supplier of blanks to the US Mint. But what is that? Now, in normal markets, that's, you know, maybe that's fine, maybe that makes economic sense as a business to do that. But what it does mean in this extreme demand um, is that the US Mint doesn't have now control, or any mint that does this doesn't have control over their whole production process. They're now at the mercy of their supplier. Now, I think what happened is that they looked at US coin demand and that chart, which I think I've seen, if you, you can go to the US Mint website and download their coin sales, and it's a, it's a very simple chart. It goes like this. And I think this, you know, this is 99,2000, and that's Y2K. It's all these people that wanted to buy physical coins in case, you know, everything collapsed and the bank balance has got wiped out. Um, and I think that was somewhat foreseeable. Now, whether the US Mint was making its blanks at this time or outsourced or not, but I think this event is somewhat foreseeable. Um, so I think the internet chatter that says, hey, you made one million or two million coins, why can't you do it again? I think the difference is that they saw this coming, they probably geared up for it and were ready for it. And then, but since then, over the next eight years, 
this production has been for Gold Eagles, I think, 400 or 500,000 or whatever. I can't remember what the stat is, but it's pretty much in a nice tight band. So I think that what they simply did, being um, smart economic business managers, is said, that's the long-term demand. So we'll enter into a long-term contract with our supplier for one million blanks every year. You know, maybe they would negotiate it every couple of years or something like that, which is fine. But then when you get this massive spike in demand, the US Mint can go to, go to the supplier and say, I need now five million blanks. And the supplier's going to say, well, I don't, you know, we've been operating for eight years at one million, now you want me suddenly to do five. I've only bought machinery and capacity to make one million per year. I can't just do five million. And I think that is part of the problem of why the US Mint hasn't been able to keep up with this demand. Um, and the other sort of interesting thing which I think will happen is that the Sunshine Mint also makes coins to sell directly to the public. So at some point, the Sunshine Mint has to make a decision to say, well, why would I... I've got limited capacity myself, and all these people that want to buy... You know, I could probably sell my entire production retail prices. Why would I want to supply... X number of blanks to the US Mint or some other mint at a wholesale price when I could fab further fabricate that into a coin and sell it at full retail price. So the problem for mints that are outsource this blank production is they may end up with a situation their suppliers say, you know, not getting anything. And they are effectively out of business because their supplier can actually make the money out of it. So I don't know where this situation is going to go. If this retail demand continues in the US, you know, I can only see further problems. I can't see the US Mint getting on top of it. Um, and it takes time. I mean, even from the Perth Mint or any Mint, it takes time to buy a machine. It takes time to get extra extruders and vacuum furnaces and all the other paraphernalia that's required to make coins. Um, I mean, to buy a Gravner um, press, which is the main press used by a lot of the industry, I think you know, picking a figure out of the air is, you know, two to three million dollars. You don't make a capital decision like that, you know, and you can't just go and say to Gravner, can I have one off the shelf, please? You know, they make them to order. Bron, so, Bron's very good, I think, at anticipating a lot of the questions people have. Uh, we have uh, two, que three questions that I can see, uh, four uh, questions. What, uh, what, uh, we're at uh, six minutes to three right now by my watch. Uh, how long do, can we continue? As long as the audience is oh, Okay, <laughs> all right, uh, Rudy, uh, go ahead. One question, you said the, the Australian government guarantees uh, the allocated storage Gold, is that correct? The no. no. Western Australian government. Western, okay, the state government. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What do they guarantee? The cash value? Gold. They, actu they guarantee ounces. Oh. Yeah, it, it, it is very... Um, look, the wording the wording in the Act... Got, was gold, um, the Perth Mincing came about as an Act of Parliament. It's not a company. It's actually a statutory authority, um, which means that it's a... It's not like a government department, it's outside of the government, but it's a thing that's created by law. And there's actually an act of parliament, it's a law. I was going to say, it's like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's a bad example. Sorry. Bad example. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to imply <laughs> that. But, but, it's in, but when they created that, they put in an explicit guarantee clause because they knew that no one in the bullion market would deal with it unless it was explicitly guaranteed by the government. Um, now that guarantee, yes, it, it is worded in terms of dollars, um, but in practice what would happen is that if we had, in the most likely scenario that that guarantee would come into play is if we had a theft or a loss of physical metal, so someone came in and stole a whole lot, and our insurers didn't pay out, because we also have insurance, there's effectively a, another risk management layer. So the government is there as the insurer of last resort, of the operations. That's interesting. You, you would want the government, though, because if they're guaranteeing ounces of gold and maybe your insurance company is only guaranteeing the dollar value of gold at the time of the theft, then uh, the government would be delighted if the insurance company paid out and paid out in fiat dollars. Uh, is that but, see, a, what, uh, but what, ha what will happen in practice if that happened? You said you're guaranteeing cash. It says the cash equivalent value if of equivalent the... Equivalent where? Which basis? I mean, we just finished talking about... Oh, did I mishear that? So the, the, the Western Australian government only guarantees the cash it's value. It's the gold. cash value. But oh, okay. well, what happens in what will happen in practice is that if we have the loss 
and you know the insurance say falls down and they're not going to pay um, it's the Perth Mint that puts the claim on the government to say we're activating that part of the act the determination of the cash value is that we'll have bought the replacement gold on the market okay. and so we'll say well that's the cash value that we need was the purchase price that we paid to get the replacement gold so it is poorly worded but and okay here, here on the end um, is it um I'm not sure if it's the role of the mint, it sees it as its role, since it seems to be um, it only wants to expose itself to uh, fabrication costs and make its money not paying the price. But could the mint raise the price of its um, of the product it sells to try and clear the market, find the market clearing level rather than have shortages? Uh, yes, look, that that is a valid question. Did, did I mean, everybody hear the question? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what I see operating in the market in general is three sort of demand management mechanisms, which are a nice way of saying restricting supply, restrict, not so much restricting supply, but restricting demand. Um, and that is this sort of um, first in, first serve. So if you happen to be in the first in the line, the phone call, you know, you'll get it. There is the allocation, so tell us everyone what you want and you all get 30% of what you want, sort of process, or using price. Um, and, you know, the US Mint's operating on an allocation basis. Um, others are probably operating on price. At the moment, because we're l sort of more last in line to have these problems, and I should point that out, I mean, the US Mint, Canadian Mint, other mints all had these supply problems before, you know, many, many months ago, and it's only the Perth Mint in the last couple of months that's had that. Um, uh, so it's first for us to work out how we're going to deal with it and I don't know the answer to that and, and we'll have to think about how do we manage that demand um, but it, it can't be just a first in sort of whoever calls and it's going to have to be some system of allocation or price where people bid up to, to get the supply or they we just allocate um, based on everyone's orders. It seems uh, like a fantastic sort of profit opportunity to make the government very happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then what will happen is, um, you know, then we will get accused of price gouging by retail consumers and, you know, <laughs> people write angry letters to the government and um, so in some sense we also operate politi uh, political considerations as well. Okay, I think, Philip, uh, yeah. you're next. Okay, thanks, sir. Talking about the government guarantee, I went to the parliament in uh, Western Australia to have a copy of the... Okay. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember you say it's set them in cash. I have to go back and read again. But there's one clause saying that you shall not lease out the gold yep. uh, in state very specifically unless you change the law. Yep. Um, Jason Homer has been saying, make the assertion that Perth Mint or the subsidiary has yes. leased out gold yes. Annual report. annual report, yeah. Can you comment on this? Yeah, um, that's uh, that's funny. I, I find that's quite funny because um, the section that he's using in the annual report is the section that I asked to get put in to hope clarify what we're doing. Um, I should point out that um, AGR Mathy, the refinery in Australia that does all the refining, um, is a partnership at law and it's 40% owned by the Perth Mint, 40% by Newmont, and 20% by Johnson Matthey. Um, and the, so in some sense that AGR entity is a separate legal entity to the Perth Mint. Um, but given that it's a partnership at law, um, you can, because partnership is everyone's all in. Joint and severally liable. Yes. Yeah. So in, what happens is the market perceives that as effectively the Perth Mint fully guaranteeing that operation as well. And in acknowledgement of that, two of our directors are on the board of AGR Mathy and we have that oversight into its operations. But that doesn't mean that it is a separate legal entity. So from our point of view, we consider it part of the family. Um, but when we lend it metal, and it needs metal, and this is what I said, I might go in and explain later about borrowing and lending and how we operate, is we have to show that as an explicit lease to AGR. And we don't consider that an exposure because we have such tight control, at least at the board level, and that control level to know what they're doing with that gold. We wouldn't lend metal out if they were a completely separate proprietary limited company on which we had no 
control as such. Um, so it shows in the annual report as a lease to AGR Mathy, um, and that I suppose raises these concerns of where you're leasing out. From our point of view we consider that because we have that 40% ownership, it's a partnership at law, and that we have that board representation that we are not in control of it, but we are in very high supervision of what they're doing, so that we can be sure that they aren't entering into um, transactions which aren't compatible with what the depository is about. Uh, well, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up on that. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like what you just said there is that, uh, sure, you have, you have a very good idea what they're doing, but they're still leasing the metal out. If that metal, now you're saying that's separate metal that you are giving them as the Perth Mint, separate metal from what is backing the, the unallocated certificates? Or is it the same metal and you don't feel it's a liability because you have such a good yeah, idea of what... Yeah. No, the, the second of those two. Choices. Yes, and, that, and that's why <laughs> that, that sounds like a, an exposure to me. Uh, it's not. A, it's not an exposure um, in our mind, um, and we're explicit about this on the website. If you read the website, it says that the unallocated metal is backed by the metal in the operations of the Mint and AGR Mathy. Okay. The mechanism by which, because it's a separate legal entity, that we get the depository unallocated to. AGR to, to fund that operation is to write them a intercompany sort of lease. So there's an explicit um, sort of arm's length transaction um, between us and AGR Mathy as a separate legal entity. Um, but yes, part of that unallocated metal held by the depository clients Sorry, is holders. at AGR through a lease Being, to AGR. Yeah, they are leasing it out. But no, they are not leasing it out. They're using, we, they're they're using it in it. their operations. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask another follow-up? Yeah. Are you? Is that? No. That well, I'm still a little confused. But go ahead. Well, maybe this will help you. Yeah. So ACR Math is a refiner. So why does it need to lease to Perth Mint Gold? Because it's getting gold from essentially the the gold miners uh, to ah, sort of wholesale okay. points. So maybe this would. Have well, maybe I need to. Yeah. Okay. Well, now <laughs> we need to explain. So <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But I think that's probably. Yeah. yeah that's probably where it's getting confusing. Uh, the reason ACR um, needs metal is because. Gold miners are greedy. <laughs> you have a miner, you have a refinery, and let's let's say you have let's just call it London Bullion Market. Okay. So that's any any end user of physical. When that miner ships Dore, eighty nine percent pure, whatever they've done, into the refinery, there's two processes. Um, Miller chlorination, I think it is, which will get that gold up to 99.5% pure. And that takes about two days. But to go to the next step to get it, which is what really everyone wants, which is 99.99% pure, um, is electrolytic, which is, you know, stick it in and have those electrodes and the gold getting attached to the anode or cathode, whatever one it is. That's a 10 day plus, and I'm, I'm, again I'm sort of speaking in averages. What happens to the miner is when he hands that gold over, in normal situation how it used to operate many years ago is they would be doing this as a toll refining. They'd say that's your gold, two days later or three days later out comes these lovely bars give the bars to you, you do what you need to do with it. Because the industry is so competitive, because there's excess capacity, is people are starting to try and find ways of grabbing this business, the refining business, we started to offer early outturn or early result. And what's happened now is that as soon as the miner hands that over, the AGR gives them value for that immediately, based on this initial assay that the miner has done. So in a sense, AGL, the refinery, any refinery is prepaying for the metal before it's even refined. It's sort of just like a, a second layer of work in process then uh, that is backing those proof yeah. mint certificates. Now, how that, does, how does this, right? now, yeah, uh, and I'll just go into the mechanism because it explains how the London market works and how an allocated and how leasing comes in. Um, what the um, process for that miner is he, um, gets that metal immediately to then go and sell straight away. But it's still two days. How does AGR give them gold when they're still sitting in the process for two days? 
what they have to do is go to your friendly bullion banker and say, I need to lease gold into my... And the bullion banker's got an accounting system, so you have a refinery um, and you have a mining account with the bullion bank. So the bullion bank says, OK, I will give you... Let's make that a 400-ounce bar. I'll give you... You're leasing from me. I will give you a credit. The refinery then says, OK, I will now transfer this credit to the miner in exchange for this physical that you have delivered to me at this point here before it's even been refined. And so then what you have got is AGR or any refinery is sitting with a lease liability in ounces saying I owe my friendly bullion banker 400 ounces. So that's a credit liability. Back to buy this bar which is sitting being currently refined 400 ounces debit physical asset. So they're completely hedged. They've got an ounce denominated liability against an ounce asset. Mm -hmm. The problem is that, and the miner's happy, he's got his unallocated credit in London, and bugger knows what they do with it, sell it forward or pay off some contract, or whatever the fancy stuff that they do with it. But it's this whole process of 10, 2 plus 10, 12, who knows, it probably goes on for a little bit more because the refineries, no one really wants. 400 ounce bars. The money is turning these things into these lovely kilo bars that have a number on them, sell them into India, you can earn more money from doing that. People want four nines gold. Perth Mint wants four nines gold to make coins out of. So AGR has now got this lease sitting here for 14 days plus um, that it needs to have before it gets nice four nines gold physically that it can deliver this bar to someone who will then pay them in cash, and the cash will be used to buy gold, which can be then credited to this account and used to repay the lease. And it's this timeline, because what you've got is this physical gold sitting in the refinery at any one time that needs to be funded. So instead of AGL going to the bullion bank to lease the gold, they come to the Perth Mint and say, you know what we're doing, you've got board oversight, you've got 40% partnership, you're on the hook for this anyway, um, should worse come to worse because of the partnership law and you have 40% of this operation. So why can't we just lend the metal that your depository clients and the have only, given you? And the only real damage done, you're saying, is that it would delay, for those people who have unallocated Perth Mint certificates, it would delay that much longer than being able to convert it into allocated yeah. or to take actual physical right. delivery. So whatever... So that, and that's and that's what they're willing to accept for not having to pay storage charges yeah. uh, on their yeah. And if you think what what is this this AGR and, I, and again I'm putting rough stats does between two to three hundred tons a year, so that's about six tons um, a week. So just at a bare minimum, forgetting this is just real raw numbers, it's at least twelve tons at any one time in that operation. And what what's your total uh, tonnage worth of uh, Perth Mint certificates? Uh, one point, outstanding. One point five billion. One point five billion. So we have a mix of gold and silver. A dollar's worth, that. you mean? Yeah. Okay. Aussie uh, dollars. Aussie dollars. Yeah, at least. I mean, this is, and this is. I mean, these are highly so, approximate numbers. So, so that would be a small percentage of your total. Uh, is that right? Small percentage. Well, not really. Twelve uh, tons at thirty-two million per ton. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Four hundred million. Ton, ton. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll keep it during. Uh, ton, ton. I'll let, let's, let's talk. <laughs> so that's that's. I mean, so, and so this really is the pro rata. It's actually a relatively small exposure, uh, unless everybody showed up and wanted their Perth Mint. Yeah, and then they just have to wait for this time yeah. to get that all okay. refined and, and made. Okay. Uh, we've got one. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you, sir, you had a question. I think. How, how much gold do you actually have in the mint at any given time? It's twelve tons. Is it? Uh, no, that's just a back of the envelope calculation. Um, I couldn't actually say it for security reasons. All right. Yeah. Well, this there's a lot. There's a fair amount at the refinery. I mean, this just on these, and these are just numbers that I'm pulling out of the air. I mean, this is 400 million dollars. Before we even start talking right. about the fact that they need to hold some inventory, that they might accumulate some stuff and sell into peaks and and troughs and distribution of that and stuff that's flying around the world at any one time. I mean, that's the absolute minimum 400. Just in the refinery, not even talking about the Perth Mint. So, um, yeah, there's, believe me, there's plenty lying around. Well, it's just I think... Look, New South Wales is close to being bankrupt. 
I mean, it can't be that many years away. And so it's a good thing the mint's over in Western Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any it more, is because, uh, and, and uh, there is some comfort in knowing that there are six tons coming out every week. Every week, six tons coming out of that pipeline. It's got to be sold. Something's got to be done with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. La last question to Daryl. Um, Brian, the refinery, AGR. Okay. The excess capacity does it still exist or not? Uh, I think that they probably do have. I don't think they're at maximum. But their focus is very much wholesale. You know, what they do is sell one tonne of kilo buyers into Asia to okay. big distributors. Okay. They're not really focused at retail level. Okay. So the, in other words, the discount, because it seems to be an, an arbitrage here. I mean, there is none. There's a there's disconnect between what paper spot is, where we're coming from, and the demand for it. Now, so your, what I want to know is that in your understanding of there is no, um, there's no lack of gold into the refinery, and there's still no lack of refining capacity to do the large orders. But there is a lack of capacity to take those the gold and break it down into <coughs> smaller, what we call the retail yeah. order. Yeah. So if I were a rich Asian, instead of it being a poor one, <laughs> I could go and call AGR and get delivered. Just like I want to, at spot, at a very close to spot. But being as it's not, I have to wait with, in line with everybody else. Yeah, I mean, think about it from, and this is just to talk on the refinery side. You know, the the way that the the operation is set up for low low quantity of transactions, high volume. You know, their guys sit up and ring their known contacts in India or Asia and say, "Do you want to buy one ton of kilo bars?" Now that's one phone call. And they have done a ton of metal. And you might say, well, why can't they sell that retail? Well, imagine, they could, then they say, well, how many phone operators do they have to have to sell 1,000 one kilo bars when you can do it in one phone call? We should set up a call center. So <laughs> even though, yeah. Help out the Brooklyn. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll say in closing here, I, uh, I rushed my introduction so quickly that I didn't properly pitch my operation. Uh, we have a representative, a new representative here uh, among us, uh, Louis Boulanger, if you'd stand up for a moment. He will be working for Boya Management Group shortly, being able to provide uh, Australians and New Zealanders and other uh, uh, vicinity uh, people both the bars program and the uh, and our fund itself uh, so ho wholesaling mm -hmm. uh, sorry thank you very much for your indulging of my uh, trying to uh, make a few sales here as well <laughs> and uh, thank you for your questions